metric is really actually metric morphometric study of the dental arch. So the morphometric is really looking at the uh, covariance between the shape and size with the surrounding structure of the biological form. So I really do not have time or I'm not, I mean, we're not really going to go really in depth into the anatomic heart tissue, geometric elements, and defining correlation to really develop into airway dental arch in depth. And I think that's the really key thing is that when a, so science of dental metrics is really putting, this is the current concept. So when you're really focusing on the straightness of the teeth and just on the occlusion, there's a two elements, only two elements that we were looking into as an orthodontist or a dentist is really looking at teeth and occlusion, right? So when you do that, it really isolates how all these teeth are really in, related into the skull. That is the biggest problem because after all, this dental arch, it's not an isolated thing. So my first question is then, is there something that can be used as a template? Because when we are choosing a template in the current theory is that we are using a uh, the deformed arch to really determine the patient's template for normal. And that's really, in a way, it's very logical. It doesn't make any sense. If we actually gonna line up the teeth, right? We're making a teeth straight as an orthodontist. Is it really just for the cosmetics? Or is it something else? What's really the significance of the orthodontia, straight teeth, beyond aesthetics and occlusion? And then now there are a lot of theories focusing on airway. Okay, any kind of work, any kind of study, we really have to come up with some kind of logical theory to base on the study. So the theory is that the teeth are really the biological element of human face or human anatomy. If then all these teeth, there's a shape and size and length and angulation, whatever we call it, then is there any really optimal organization that we can use it as a template, such as angle use the profile as a template to define the beauty of the person. So in dental metrics, we're going to start to see the crooked teeth not as a cause of the model collision, but as a result of facial deformity. So if you are just thinking that it's a facial deformity, then it's not only going to shift the teeth into the model collision or crooked crookedness of the teeth, but it also going to affect all the other structures around the dental arch. So this time I'm going to talk about the dental arch and its morphology. Morphology means the shape and size, how the shape and size of the teeth are all put together to function better. It's oddly very interesting that we, when the patient comes in, this is what we define as the patient's normal. So there's just something that doesn't fit into the picture that why do we have so many normal variations? And then the other thing is the technique. They're just such expanding so much but at the end, you're closing it back. So the big question is how much expansion, expansion is justified? And without really looking at morphology, shape, and size within an arch, I mean, if something is split this much, would you ever consider this to be normal? So what are you actually accomplished even despite the fact the patient feels better? And autonomy, so what have we really accomplished here? It's why, okay, but this is what we went through. Is it really necessary step to do this much of change on the patient's face? So our career, my career as orthodontist, is really based a lot by assumption. So as long as teeth are in class one, teeth are straight, we think it's normal. But that's not always true. I mean, this patient has very straight teeth, class one occlusion. What is going on? So the occlusion itself and straightness of the teeth itself, themselves, really cannot be used as a principal factor to really define the normal shape and size of the dental arch. So when the patient has expression like this, okay, what, what, is there any other application to the health? They look very narrow. So I always just say the current method of diagnosis in orthodontics is a flat word. We need to actually put them into multi-dimensional layers to it. So the biggest problem, Step. We are choosing the molar incisor just to be to archive all the information, all the possible landmark points in between the, uh, the incisor and molar. And how about the other side? So whatever we decide that you know the angulation of the incisor and the molar position doesn't actually translate directly into the arch morphology. 
So, for example, you know, we trace before and after teeth move here and there from the green to pink. <laughs> so, dental metrics, what it means is that let's really look at what happens when something moves from pink to green. Okay. So, is it really just the, the uh, scale change or what? Is something else that changed in terms of the shape and size. Because when you think about it, tooth size is already determined. So the perimeter, the length of how long or how big the size of the teeth already pre it's predetermined. So from second molar to second molar, I'm extruding the wisdom teeth because our human no longer can accommodate the third molar. So from second molar, medial dis dis distance is already set by the uh, nature. So when it happens, when things are changing from one point to one point, is it really just linear movement? or it's not. So for example, when the patient was nicely finished and opened up, okay? So it really doesn't matter at this point. Let's not even think about what caused it and how we're gonna treat. So let's really see what happened here, okay? So to me, this changed. If I'm gonna treat this case, Am I going to stripping and pushing this and that? No, I'm just going to open this intercanine width. Then this arch will just sinking back to where they're supposed to be. So that was one of the issues in orthodontics that we think everything is in an almost an like open system. Unfortunately, this system is enclosed. So when a point changes from pink to green, whole shape and size changes. The biggest question is we have a, from second molar to second molar, this is already set by the uh, uh, width of the teeth. Then what is the arch form? So the arch variation from here to here, here to there, all these landmarks, we have to think as a co exist as a covariate. We don't look at it as, it is a variable, right? Because that's what you're varying. But we are not thinking in terms of the covariate. So we really have to think now from second molar to second molar, what, what's the arch form that we can call it as a normal? That's the biggest question. So we have this evolutionary element when the arch is or formed. And as I said, this is already predetermined. Curve of speed, curve of Wilson, that's all part of a process of this, all the elements of the teeth becoming the arch form. And then once this arch form is formed, and then now we have to correlate with the uh, skull structure. So what's the natural shape of the arch? There's a two elements that's dictated by the width of the teeth, and then there's another element that's dictated by the thickness of the teeth. So in a way, because arch is a secondary, because the thickness of the teeth is actually forming the arch form. So what's really important is how the teeth are all aligned into the skull is more of the question. Every single dimension of the teeth, there's a reason for it. So when you see it, it's how, how teeth are anatomically organized into the skull. That's the internal organization. And then they are put into most natural arch form. So everything is moving in a uh, rotation, not a linear movement. One of the mistakes in, I think, orthodontic analysis, we think is we can intrude, extrude, linearly move. No, it's not. It's, uh, everything is around the rotation of center of the body. And sometimes we call it center of rotation or center of body. And that's what actually angle defines. The medial buccal cusp is becoming actually the center of the body of the, the dental arch and also center of body for the rotation. And actually teeth are actually aligned outside of the nasal cavity. So to look at the palate as a, only the oral structure is, is in a way it's not a good idea because Embryologically, the palate is forming the oral, roof of the oral cavity, but also the base of the nasal cavity. So when you see the deformity on the palate, yes, it's going to affect the airway. Simple as that. I mean, I didn't, I'm not going to go detail into this optimal human arch form. I call it OHDA. And this thick line is actually the baseline. Just if angle use the staff or the use the profile as a baseline, now we're going to use the actual skeletal point as a baseline, which is more stable, which is more predictable, and which is more measurable. And it's actually proportion from that point. Okay? So instead of looking at that as a normal, now we're going to look at it from as a shift from this optimal arch form. So optimal arch 
form is when there's no functional forces being applied. It's a purely anatomic stage. So for example, when this patient comes in like that, that's a really proportional shift. So if you actually see the constriction, we think it's a size matter. No, the shape is deformed right there. Same thing. Here, this canine is high. The shape is deformed, the internal organization. That's the nasal floor. And that's what explains the high palate. So when I was going to the residency, like, like really, we all talk about high palate, but then nobody says what the significance of it. Like, so what? Then why even bother putting on the problem list? So once you put it on the problem list, we have to really understand where it's coming from. It's coming from the fact that that gets squeezed in, then the palate gets high. I'm not going to go through too much about the principal segment. So the, my goal as one of one, when I started the dental metric was that can, it's almost like a principal factor analysis. What it is, can we actually use a certain component or certain element to be able to predict outcome? That's the principal analysis, principal factor analysis. So I just call it principal segment. So which means that can we use a certain segment in a dental office that we can predict the patient's arch form and airway dimension? And you can see that how much this patient, this should be normal. So then we can work on bringing it in and bring the canine out and everything will be into normal shape and size. And that's where my device is coming from, to really unshape and really try to organize how the teeth are supposed to be organized into the skull in relation to airway. So oral cavity and dimension of the oral cavity and the nasal cavity is coincidence, it's correlated because they are biologically developed by same bone and same origin, which are the maxillary process or maxillary prominences and and then it's the medial, nasal, facial prominences. It's the same process as creating the nasal and oral cavity. So now we have to really start to think as an arch case for arch deformation. Okay, we have to really look at when somebody comes in, instead of looking at class one to three, how much crowding, let's really think what's the degree of the deformation of this patient. So this child, so now, I mean, don't even look at classification, but she's class one. So what are you going to say? Oh, you have a normal occlusion, therefore you're normal, like go home? No. <laughs> Obviously, this child has really a lot of problems. And look at this child, always a sore. She's mouth breather, tired, look at her eyes. She has a teary eyes. She has allergies, asthma, you name it. So, and when the arch gets so constricted like this, this is constriction. The canine is a big problem because when you see this kind of panel and see this white line and all the teeth are on up there, the roots are, it's almost like right in your nose and they're going to be impacted. So we want to prevent it. Her lower arch is going to be also constricted. So end of the phase one, she still did not have a room for the canine. So I usually agree with the concept of Dr. Gianelli. So he was big in saving the east space. And I did the same thing, but look at it. We can actually gain the uh, canine space. So this is the first day of the braces. So from here, and actually without any extraction, she only had the braces for 14 months for the full braces. So when these teeth moved from the arch collapsed this much, look at the palate, that's a translation. So almost when there's a something straight, and if you push that, it's just going to go up. So it's almost like equal but opposite force is never lying. You know, we have to really give a great respect to that of the physicist in the history. So I, I just did exactly what this dictates anatomically. So when you move the teeth, so from here, she does, she became very athletic, she can breathe, and she doesn't, she does not have much of an allergy issue. But she still has a functional issue, so we have to really follow through with the functional therapy. That's another level of orthodontics. So patient comes in like that. I mean, this molar is a class one. It doesn't touching each other. And the canine is actually kind of, you know, so you're going to say that the patient is kind of normal. He's just hugely deformed. And look at his gummy smile. So gummy smile is also another function of a deformity. So when you look at it, he's got this little methadone spot for the extracted, but 
this is really not normal. So we have to start to think that when this happens, it's really going to affect all the surrounding structure, which is the natural cavity. So this is 11 weeks with the SLDA. I'm just trying to line up so that he can have a just outside of an airway. So in human face, there's an oral cavity, nasal cavity, and the teeth are then just erupted outside of that. So seven months, um, and also when the patient starts looking like they are having this lineup, then I usually take it out and start braces. And this is, um, and then I started doing the elastics with the fit the canine, and this is how the patient looks. So. After 16 months of total and 13 months of the braces, I'm ready to be debanded. So from here to here, smile from here to here. I mean, you, you have to start to notice the eye, uh, the, uh, eye level, okay, how you smile and his posture. And one of his same amount that now he used to really like the foot playing football and he's now playing in you know, all the sports. He can breathe better. And he's dating. <laughs> I mean, look at him. He looks just totally different guy. And that's what you can do for your sort of patient. And if you have to, you know, extract and that and that, you really cannot change this kind of smile line. Because you're accepting that as a patient's normal arch parameter. So I think it was better to ask me then, how do you know how much you expand? It's all coming from this dimension. It doesn't really show here it's too faint, but there's a line from the canine to here. So that's the airway dimension. Now you can actually estimate what will be your anatomic or cranial airway dimension by looking at the dental size. So this is another concept that a lot of people ask um, about tongue posture and about the cranial nerve innovation to all these muscles that comes in, including the tongue. That's the, the, the balance between sensory and the motor function, but that's we're going to talk about it next time.